was reading the newspaper the other day, and uh, there was a hearing at uh, in Congress in the House of Representatives. It was Kit Indy called the Science and Technology and Space Committee, and they were grilling a Woods Hole scientist on climate change, uh, and trying to find a way to demonstrate or to get him to admit it really wasn't happening. Uh, and so they were focusing on the oceans rising. And the first question was, isn't that happening because of all the silt coming out of the Mississippi River? <laughs> that one didn't fly. So the next question was, what about the rocks that are falling off the white cliffs of Dover? <laughs> if you have that question, hold it. <laughs> Um, the first speaker uh, we're really happy to have is Richard Belfast. I get that right? Great. Um, who is the president and CEO of the International Crane Foundation, which is a treasure for Wisconsin, the nation, and the, and the world. You'll <laughs> hear. He has a, a background in civil engineering, masters in water resource management, and a PhD in land resources, hydrology, and plant ecology. Uh, his passion clearly is wildlife, birds, and cranes in that order. Um, and uh, his wife, Katie, who many of you have met uh, at the Ridges Festival of Nature, uh, works for the Wisconsin Wetlands Association and was instrumental in the Ramstar designation that runs from uh, international wetland designation that runs from the Mink River to the ridges. Uh, so uh, as he'll talk, uh, he has worked extensively in Africa uh, for several groups, including the foundation, uh, and uh, has been in at the, the president's role following George Armstrong since 2010. Um, it looks to me like, uh, just with a brief review, that uh, cranes are the canary in the climate coal mine. So. All right, we're on. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll start with a little show of hands. Who's actually been to the Crane Foundation in Baraboo? Ah, I always love to see that. Good, lots of folks. Um, so uh, as Roy said, I've been with the Crane Foundation for quite a while, and I, s I speak a lot about our work globally and, and some of the lessons we try to pull from it on water and land stewardship and so on. And this climate change talk is, is something new that I've been working on, and uh, I think an interesting way uh, to try and deal with some issues that we're struggling with in the getting the public to care about climate change world, and I'll focus on that today. But uh, I really want to thank uh, Roy and Mary and Dick and all the sponsors here. We had a delightful evening together last night. Really great to meet my fellow speakers and to have a chance to be here. It's delightful to be up here. Uh, and let me see if I can get the clicker going the right way. Ah, okay. Well, we've all seen some version of this and lived some version of this, uh, the battle between lots and lots and lots of information about climate change and the anecdotal world. In fact, it did snow in April this year quite a bit. <laughs> uh, and I'm actually kind of sympathetic to the It Snowed in April guy uh, because I think we're really still struggling with getting people to care and connect on climate change issues. And an example is if you like fishing in Wisconsin and you want to go out fishing and you just want to know how's climate change going to affect your favorite trout fishery, it's, it's hard. there's been a lot of good work on it, but it's, it's hard to talk about these issues. I found this model for the relationship between climate change and salmon and trout. <laughs> it's not a, not a good thing to ch share in most public forums. Uh, so we're, we're struggling and, and we all know in our hearts things are changing. Things are changing rapidly. The data back that, uh, those changes. Um, but we're still struggling to communicate them. And uh, I think there's been some very good efforts. Certainly Audubon and BirdLife had a broad uh, paper that came out on birds and climate change uh, just a couple years ago. But um, I don't know many people that have looked at that or read it or have any real feel for it because I think we're still struggling to make those, those deep connections. So, uh, and, and I think the framework I like to talk about on this is framework of risk. Sort of what are the consequences, what are the risks and consequences of taking action or not taking action. And I think how we view 
those risks has a lot to do with whether we care about the things being affected in some sort of personal way and it drives us to want to take action about them. And, and I find even within our foundation, even within our board and our visitors, we can especially struggle here in Wisconsin in the wetter, you know, sort of northeast, midwest, northeast part of the country to get people to just feel there's risk to climate change, like it's really going to affect their life and things they care about. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about where there's a lot of risk going on. I'm going to talk about the world of cranes. Um, and just talk about, is climate change risky for cranes? Is it risky for something that a lot of people around the world, as I'll explain, care about? Um, is it risky? This is a shot from April of a poor sandhill <laughs> buried in snow just not that long ago. Now it's nice and warm, but rough spring, uh, but they're doing fine. So let me start out uh, just a little bit on why cranes um, and kind of make the case why I think cranes might be a good canary, uh, canary in the coal mine for us on this issue. Uh, for a few reasons. One is um, we share deep cultural and spiritual connections with cranes around the world. I don't know if you know how rich they are, but they're, they're very deep. Uh, partly I think it's their high visibility, uh, their dancing, which they're famous for, and their unison calls that people can see in the wild. These birds right here are six feet tall, so they look and, and dance with you eye to eye. They're great parents. We've kind of begun to love the whooping crane story here in Wisconsin as we bring them back into the wild. They have spectacular migrations. These are cranes flying over France. They, they do uh, many thousand mile migrations over diverse landscapes around the world. Many of the species do. And they congregate in fantastic numbers. Maybe some of you have heard about the Platte uh, River in Nebraska or even here in Wisconsin. We're getting 10,000 and more on the Wisconsin River here in the fall. This is the Hula Valley in Israel where thousands and thousands of Eurasian cranes concentrate. Uh, so those are spectacular. And because of all this, and maybe more, uh, cranes are, are really indelibly imprinted into our histories in many parts of the world. This is ancient uh, rock art in Utah. Um, they're in wedding kimonos in Japan. They're actually mentioned in the story of how Buddha discovered suffering, was over the shooting of a Saris crane. Um, they're in the, the Ramadan, and they're in many of the foundational uh, spiritual texts of the world. And because of that, they've become pretty culturally embedded. The crane is actually in the middle of the national flag of Uganda, which is pretty cool. They're on money all over the world um, and all sorts of stuff. This is, the, uh, uh, one of the, this is the coat of arms of Uganda with a nice little crane in there. So people are strongly attached to them. They've infiltrated the microbrew market, which is another sign of success. So they are deep, they are deep in culture around the world. And yet, at the same time, they're actually very sensitive indicators of environmental change. Uh, our sandhills here in Wisconsin are a little more generalist cranes, but a lot of them aren't. And they have very specific needs uh, on breeding grounds, very specific uh, habitat requirements, and especially feeding. Some of them have highly specialized diets that are very sensitive to environmental change, like our whooping cranes on the uh, coast of Texas, which got down to only 15 in the world only 50 years ago. Uh, a number of cranes feed on vegetation matter uh, that only grows under certain conditions. Um, and even their flocking requirements and roosting requirements, they need specific water levels and, and all to, to establish. So they have specific requirements. They're actually good indicators of change. And as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, these are cranes here at the base of the Tibetan um, glacial highlands. Uh, they're good indicators of climate change on many fronts that I hope will be useful. Um, a third reason I think they're useful is, is their flagships, and we've worked through cranes now for about 40 years, in, large, in part for cranes, but in large part because when you work to save cranes, they create extraordinary conservation opportunities. Uh, China's probably the best example of all. There's actually 46 crane reserves specifically created for cranes, and then, of course, benefiting many other species in China, about 71 million acres set aside for cranes, tells you something about how much they love cranes in that part of the world. Um, this is what you also save in those places, including all the world's swan geese, which co-occur with cranes and other threatened species, and all kinds of diverse birds, uh, unusual mammals like these toothed deer and all that co-occur and are protected by these areas that are set up for cranes. So they create great conservation opportunities through that passion that people have and that cultural connection, spiritual connection, people have with these birds. 
And then a lot of our story um, with our work at the Crane Foundation and a lot of people that we work with relates back to the people that share these lands too because we find over and over again when we're trying to work, work, protect these lands, we're also protecting the working relationship people have with lands, whether it's farmers or fishers, people that harvest resources from these areas. So we're often trying to build coalitions for conservation of these areas. And that's fundamental to the, to the climate change stories I want to talk about. Um, I think cranes have served as a valuable uh, ambassador, uh, ambassadors for bringing people together. A couple, of, a couple of good ones long before the overtures of Trump to North Korea, we were actually working with the North and South Koreans uh, on crane issues. It's one of the only things they talk to each other about, but we have had conferences bringing them together for many years. Uh, even before the, the unified Olympic team, there was a unified crane team. Uh, working together, and, and we have, at least until the last about eight months, uh, had an active project in North Korea, which we lost permission to do, but we'll get back, like so many good things, we'll, it'll come back <laughs> uh, after certain changes uh, politically, and um, we'll have more opportunities. Um, we had a pretty interesting project for the Siberian crane, which is critically endangered, that covered 11 countries and brought together Russia, China, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, again, working together for the common good of this flyway of the birds. So they really do bring people together. I always like to bring people together. Chicago, I grew up in Chicago, and we take them down. Um, people come in, uh, and uh, this is a group of Zambian conservationists we're working with. Um, and there are about 30, 35 crane festivals around the world. This is one in Bhutan where people come to celebrate these birds. So, I think they're, they're a tool for uh, bringing people together and, and sharing that passion and hopefully doing good things. But despite all those good positive things, bringing people together, working through cranes to save great places, working through them as indicator species, they're, they're actually among the most endangered family of birds on Earth. And that's something we don't see here in Wisconsin where our, our sandhills are exploding. You know, we have these amazing numbers of sandhills. That is not the story around most of the world. In fact, 11 of the 15 crane species are endangered, uh, critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable to extinction. And even these few uh, cranes out there that are not formally endangered have populations in decline or subspecies that are endangered. It's a very endangered family of birds, and I think it's in part because they are sensitive indicators of environmental change and are suffering from a lot of changes on the land. And those, those changes we probably all know, but I, I think before going into any discussion of climate change, it's really important to remind ourselves that what climate change does is exacerbate changes to the land that are already happening, right? If we had somehow had an incredibly diverse functioning landscape, climate change would still create problems, but problems would be a lot less uh, than, than what they are in the context of what is already happening in our land. And I think it's that that interplay that is so critical to understand. But it's, it's the same old stories we hear, conversion of wetlands to other purposes, agriculture and other uses, big dams. We do a lot of work on big dams in Asia and especially in Africa uh, and how they affect floodplain areas, water diversions, uh, often resulting in, in hydrologic change. And, and of the 11 species of cranes that are endangered, Nine of them, the number one reason is changes in water and hydrology, and that, that's part of why they're so sensitive to, to climate change. Um, uh, changes in the watersheds, development of the watersheds, often leading to uh, issues of water quality in many places around the world where cranes uh, live and breed, and then all kinds of emerging problems. This is actually a whooping crane down in Texas where they winter right by the huge refineries of uh, Corpus Christi in that area. That's where their last remaining population is. So lots of challenges with environmental contaminants and all too. And a lot of narrow misses like the BP oil spill and uh, Hurricane Harvey that I'll actually talk about in a little bit. So that's sort of the, the crane context. Uh, a loved bird, a loved family of birds, a very endangered family of birds, and a, and a family of bird that faces all the same problems that we're trying to deal with more broadly in conservation. Narrowing down on a bird of groups Oh, sorry, a group of birds doesn't get us off the hook for dealing with most of these big conservation issues. It, it drags us into just about all of them. So, so here we are, you know, trying to make sense of this, all these changes to the earth that are coming, changes in snow and ground cover in our surface waters and our oceans and everything else that everyone here, I'm sure, is very well informed about. 
trying to tie this down and look through the lens of the cranes of the world. And I'll try to talk about how some of those problems are playing out and a little bit about what we know and don't know. So this is the world of cranes. We've got a whole bunch of cranes in Asia, a bunch of cranes in Africa, our whoopers in sand hills, the rarest crane, in, one of the rarest bird in North America, the whooper, and one that's increasingly one of the more abundant, the sand hill, um, here. And I'll pull out some examples. So uh, I want to start with polar warming and getting a sense of, of the change that's happening in our poles. And I'm gonna, these are all, I'm going to give relatively short examples here that can be drawn out um, more fully at another time, but just to give you a sense. So Siberian crane is a critically endangered species in East Asia, uh, primarily Russia and China. Um, we've been working for a long time on their wintering grounds, which is where we thought the primary problems were all of the Siberian cranes of the world winter in southern China, where they're proposing dams that uh, will have a big effect. So we, we focused a lot on how to um, resolve problems on their wintering ground. But increasingly, the biggest concern for these birds is up where they breed. They breed on the north slope of Russia in the far north uh, area called Yakutia. And there, uh, this is an example of the kind of changes happening up in that area. Or maybe it's easier to understand this way, but it is uh, rapidly changing landscape. And what's happening is a lot of that north slope ice is breaking up. And they, they nest up there and produce these little guys in a habitat like this that's uh, very dependent on the frozen tundra of the North Slope of Russia. That's where all of these breeding birds are. They're scattered out over this area. And our Russian colleagues there have been working to really document what's happening on the, in that tundra area for a long time uh, and trying to get a sense of it and producing stuff like this that's hard to follow. But basically, um, Smaller lakes are breaking up and forming much bigger lakes, and the cranes are often, and other birds that winter up there are on the edges of these lakes, and a lot of their habitat is disappearing very quickly up there with the changes in permafrost and, and those, the sort of uh, breakdown of some of the lakes up there. And what that means for Siberian cranes, we don't know. We, uh, we expect that there will be a significant impact, but we don't know. We know that uh, the birds will not be able to stay where they're currently breeding, and they'll have to shift to new areas inland. Um, there's a lot we don't know, but we certainly would argue that the risk of change up there to these birds is quite high. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a critically endangered species. So it's, it's an evolving story, uh, but there's no question that they're already being displaced from significant areas up in that region. Not too far from there, we can look at the vulnerable black neck crane and glacier melting. It's a very interesting bird. Their population is all up in Bhutan and the Tibetan Plateau. They're a very high altitude nesting bird. Um, these, are, these are glaciers back here, and they nest, and they nest entirely in the glacial melt of, of uh, the meltwaters of glaciers. So they're completely dependent on those wetlands that are maintained from glacial meltwater. And they are up there. And Currently, uh, as we know, the retreat in this area is the most rapid glacial retreat in the world from the Tibetan highlands. So that's very well documented among the world of uh, climate change. It's one of the things we're able to document very clearly right now as well as project. So big changes there. And in the short term, that's actually been pretty beneficial. There's actually a lot more water coming off of those Tibetan glacial highlands than there was even 20, 30 years ago because of the melting. So there's actually been a short-term benefit to the population. Their numbers are going up. But as those retreat, and they're retreating quickly, those waters are going to go. Uh, and those habitats will be gone. So what will they do? We don't know. <laughs> Unknown number two. Uh, but we know that the risk of glacial melting up there to this population and to other species that use those Tibetan highlands is very high. They're very likely. Um, to lose most of these grounds over time as the meltwaters uh, ultimately uh, play out. And of course, these are also the lands that are source waters of most of the great rivers of the world, the Ganges, the Mekong, the Brahmaputra, and all. So it, it will have profound effect on a lot of the world that goes way beyond cranes. But the change is happening now. Uh, a bird that's particularly close to my heart, I did my doctorate work on these birds and worked on them for a long time through the Crane Foundation. Wattle cranes, which are another endangered species in southern Africa, are a great signal for drying rivers. And uh, here, uh, the data are also quite strong. 
Uh, most of the world's wattle cranes occur in the waters of the Zambezi River and the Okavango and some of the big river systems of southern Africa, big spectacular systems. Um, and they're a great example of, of this sort of sensitive ecological relationship. These little dots right here are eggs. And they build this floating platform at high flood to get protection from predators and from trampling and all. And so they're, they're completely dependent, their nest building and their nesting success is completely uh, dependent on healthy floods that come down from these rivers each year. Uh, and they also feed on the tubers of this plant. You, you actually have this plant up here in Door County. It's a sedge called Eliacaris. But in Africa and Asia, it produces tubers that the birds eat. And those enormous birds are almost, they're five and a half feet tall, but they pretty much entirely depend on these little tubers that grow under, underground. So again, very sensitive diet that they're linked to. And this is, uh, you've seen, I don't like to put up too much of this data because it can be hard to follow. But when you look at the sort of key areas where we're expecting a lot of change, this is the Zambezi River Basin right here. And South Africa, Cape Town, of course, which has been a lot in the news as it runs out of water. Southern Africa and the Zambezi Basin is the same story. So there's tens of millions of people that depend on the waters of this system. Uh, most of the world's wild cranes, a lot of the world's elephants, uh, a lot of the world's buffalo and all are completely tied into this system. And it's one of the more drought prone areas. In fact, the Zambezi Basin has the worst climate future of any of the river basins in Africa. Uh, and when you sort of, it's hard to absorb data and feel data, uh, but I've lived in this region for a long time. When you talk about a 20, you know, a 40% reduction in water availability that they're projecting out, um, maybe it'll happen a little bit later, maybe it won't happen by 2050, maybe it'll be worse, some of the models are worse. It, it is profound. You think about our rivers losing on a permanent basis almost half of their water. It's, it's profound change coming to these regions, being driven by climate change. Uh, I did some modeling work on what that means for hydropower. Most of the hydropower in the region will no longer be economical at all. <laughs> and uh, it's um, serious, serious change coming to this region. Uh, and, and that will, of course, uh, affect our beloved wattled cranes and buffalo and many other floodplain dependent species. But also, fundamentally, people's ability to live and adapt uh, to, to climate change and other things over time uh, will be profoundly affected for fisheries, for people who uh, uh, produce agriculture in these floodplains and use other resources, even for prawns. One of our partners in Mozambique has been the prawn industry because they know their vulnerability to reduce runoff is huge uh, in that area. So it's, it's very interesting. So again, we don't know the future of wild cranes, of other wildlife, and of the people that all depend on these plains. But we do know the trending is not good, and the risk uh, to uh, the kinds of climate change we're looking at are profound. Let's bring it uh, back closer to home here with our whooping cranes, uh, another example, whooping cranes and sea level rise. Interesting enough, we, we do a lot of work with whooping cranes in Texas and, and on sea level rise. And as long as you don't call it climate change, Texas is incredibly involved in, in sea level rise work from top to bottom, government level, governor, uh, uh, city level, and all. So they fully embrace trying to deal with climate, with uh, sea level rise. They just won't tie it to climate change. So there's so lots of work down there on it. Well, all of the world's whooping cranes basically winter down in Aransas. As I mentioned before, it got down to about 15 in the wild in the 1940s. So it's a good recovery story. There's about 400 in the wild now. They're slowly coming back. It's still basically the rarest bird in North America that's not extinct or on the verge of extinction. Um, and they have that specialized diet I mentioned before. They eat blue crabs, which are very tasty. It's one of the better, I think, diets a bird might have. They eat those. They're, they're like those Maryland blue crabs you get. Very tasty. Uh, they eat those, and they do it largely because they need that energy to migrate 2,000 miles to far northern Canada and produce chicks. So they need a lot of energy in the winter. Well, you've all seen variations of this, projections of where. But I think uh, you know, in the world of climate science, it's one of the most uh, well-known documented uh, projections. Very likely, I guess, is, is, is a, a high level of probability in the, the IPCC reports that we are getting sea level rise. And, our team has been working on what that sea level rise means for whooping cranes on the coast, even relatively moderate levels. Uh, they, have, they use a range of habitats along the coast, especially though these coastal marsh systems that come in. 
uh, that form uh, at, with the current water levels down there. And this is the Lamar Pen Peninsula, part of the Aransas complex where the birds are. And it's just, it's just to sort of give a sense of overall changes. But you know, this is the current uh, mix of habitats. And that's linked entirely to these water levels. So you can imagine what happens over time. This is just with a, a couple foot water level increase, with basically a three foot, one meter water level over time. A lot of their coastal habitat is lost uh, and looks, looks very different. And so you know, the question is, what, what then happens? Will new marsh form moving inland? Will it form at a rate to keep up with water level rise as it moves inland? We can try to pr predict these things. It's not easy pr to predict, you know, to what degree. And will the land exist further inland for marsh to be created when sea level? Will, can we protect land now that may be open grassland that is going to become marshland in 20, 30 years or whenever uh, these ice sheets start to really go? And so. I think there are big questions that we're trying to, to tackle. And then on, on top of that, whooping cranes are a good example of some crane species, like other species out there, aren't just affected by one climate change factor, but multiple climate change factors. In addition to sea level rise, they're very vulnerable to extremes of weather on both ends. Um, this is the, the, the watershed for them. They get, it gets fed by the Guadalupe, San Antonio rivers that um, uh, drain even water from Austin, but especially San Antonio down into their coastal habitat, very close to Corpus Christi there in Texas. Um, the, drought, the big droughts in Texas, which have basically gone on for about 10 years, uh, they started in 2009. And the drought was so severe in 2009 that they created a whole new category of drought called exceptional. It used to just go through extreme. In 2009, they created this new category that hadn't been seen before. You might remember these stories. They're all over public radio. Well, then by 2011, the whole state was this new category of exceptional. It, it gives you a sense of the scale of that. And then that's been you know, persistent uh, in many years since then. I could show other years in there. So Texas has become, start, like a lot of our Southwest, really starting to experience more extremes. Can we directly tie them to climate change? Maybe, maybe not yet. <laughs> we will probably, in hindsight, when it's maybe too late, be able to show those uh, it, with all the statistical uh, soundness, we may seek to do so, but it, the patterns are, are getting pretty clear. Um, and with that, uh, the fresh water that flows inland down into the Texas coast that, that maintains the salinity levels that allow blue crabs to be available in those marshes and other species. So it's a very strong link there. Um, and of critical importance, too, is, is it feeds the little freshwater areas. It's a very salty environment, but cranes and other birds down there need some fresh water, too, to drink. And so it affects those. And, and in 2009, 10% uh, of the world's whooping cranes died off just due to the lack of fresh water on the coast. There was about 230 in the world at the time, and 23 died in, in the winter of 2009 basically to a combination of stress from lack of fresh water and lack of food in the marshes, uh, just related to those extreme droughts that were coming in. And then last year, we had a very interesting situation. Old Harvey came in <laughs> and hammered the Texas coast uh, with big impact. Again, there's Corpus Christi. This is Whooping Crane Central uh, right here. They were up in Canada at the time, but we had a lot of interest to see can a huge hurricane event help to reset this incredible drought. Maybe it'll serve some benefit. Uh, it destroyed our office in Texas, uh, which we've since rebuilt and caused a lot of damage down there. But one of the things of most concern was this huge storm surge, uh, because that's bringing in a lot of salt water into these environments. So when you have a combination of sea level rise and then potential for increased in extreme events like hurricanes, you get that double combination, can bring a lot of salt water in. Um, we got lucky. Because when Harvey kind of spun around and came back out, it dumped a ton of freshwater rain, not only on Houston, which was really extreme, but also on the coastal marshes and, and served to kind of flush them back out. So fortunately, um, it worked for whooping cranes, and they, they got some uh, actual habitat reprieved down there by getting some more freshwater in that helped counter the many years of drought. They're still in a huge drought deficit there, but it, it helped improve. So, Complicated. <laughs> you've, got, you've got sea level rise coming in. You've got the potential for extreme events on both ends, unprecedented droughts, maybe unprecedented storms. Hard things to get your mind around, but there's no doubt that 
the risk to the future of whooping cranes on the coast is very tightly tied to what happens with these events in that future. And, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very risky future. Just a couple more quick, quick stories here. Uh, just to give examples about indirect um, uh, impacts of climate change, a big one is fire as these areas dry out, for example, across China and Russia with the red crown crane and other uh, endangered species. We're seeing a, a big increase in fires and they have a direct impact burn, these are crane eggs burned up in a fire here. Um, again, giving a sense of some of the indirect uh, effects, not only directly to water, but some of the other uh, things that can result. A really interesting concerning one is with uh, the gray crown cranes, once abundant in East Africa. That's, this is now an endangered species, which is sort of shocking in and of itself, but part of the reason is there's been a lot of development of wetlands in their area over time and drying out of small wetlands that they need in East Africa uh, with shifts in climate and development patterns. And, it, and it's exposed all the nests to collection and they're, so they're collect eggs and the chicks are collected and put into different, um, into compounds and exported to different parts of the world. And so the cranes are being sort of loved to death by being exported out into the wild, but it's in large part because they are not able to hide their nests uh, with the diversity of wetlands that they needed naturally to be able to do so, they're much more exposed um, to, it, to communities. And then uh, one last one here, the interesting patterns with the blue crane, the national bird of South Africa, and agricultural change. This is a bird that has been doing very, very well and been going up in numbers. They've adapted to a combination of winter wheat and diversified agriculture uh, down in the Cape Town region, actually, where, where they're having these big uh, water shortages right now. They've done very well in diversified agricultural schemes. They like hanging out with ostriches. These are little <laughs> ostriches hanging out here. And um, they've been doing very well, but the Cape in adapting to climate change is shifting more to certain monotypes of agriculture they can maintain, canola and other things, shifting out of that diversified winter wheat. And the projection for future habitat for blue cranes across that whole region is extremely bleak. <laughs> um, so where would they go? We don't know. And I, I think, um, that, that's a big challenge in trying to, to see what will happen with that displacement. Uh, and, and then invasive species as well that we all know up here, uh, affecting crane populations in many places. One of the interesting ones is with the whooping cranes along the Texas coast where black mangrove has been really marching up from Mexico right up the coast there because of uh, low, uh, warm overnight temperatures and warm winter temperatures that allow it to progress north. It's a, it's actually a, a well-documented uh, climate change expander coming up from the south, and it directly displaces the open habitat a lot of water birds need, so. Phew, all right. So that's a lot of impacts. Uh, I often wish Dr. Seuss was still around and could adapt the Lorax to climate change. I think he would do it better than any of us possibly could, make us feel it better, but where are these birds gonna go? We don't know. You know, there's not one bird that I can, one of these cranes I can say with 100% certainty that climate change is gonna drive it right out to extinction. We don't know. It's a lot of uncertainty. Um, there's hope, uh, as I'll talk about in a minute. They've been resilient, like our sandhills. Uh, but it's a huge preponderance of change out in the landscape. Uh, they're already endangered during, due to changes we've already done to our landscapes, irrespective of what's started and coming down the pipe with climate change. So it's an enormous challenge. And again, to me, it's we're sitting right here. <laughs> and I think we shouldn't kid ourselves, uh, and I'm preaching the choir here, but this, this, is where, this is where we sit. You know, whether you are someone who thinks climate change is very unlikely and doesn't believe in it, or, or you do, <laughs> the impacts and the potential for impacts are very high, and I think, um, I hope much as, much as the polar bear has been a rallying species for the north, the cranes can serve as one of these rallying species in the bird world because people do care about them in a lot of places around the world. So what should we do? Uh, I just wanna give a couple more hopeful examples rather than ending on all this uh, bleakness. <laughs> uh, obviously, as, as we all know, the first thing you would do in a very risky situation is try and manage that risk address it, <laughs> assess it, be concerned about it, and take action. And this is where I think there are some good stories, some work we're involved in with partners, lots of other good work happening out there. Where I, what I think helps us learn that if we try to adapt and 
uh, understand, accept, understand the climate change that's happening, uh, combine with other development and try to make a difference. Um, there are opportunities out there that can help rejuvenate these landscapes and these birds. Uh, we've been very involved in restoring floodplains with environmental flow releases, working with large dam operators. And what's interesting about this work is that when you look at all of the users of water downstream in these systems on these floodplains, cumulatively, it actually outweighs the benefit of direct hydropower generation from these systems. So for example, if you reduced hydropower by 10% and used it as a multi-functioning river system rather than just a hydropower system, you actually get much greater net benefit overall. So we've been working on those cases in Africa, uh, trying to build coalitions uh, around those realities. Um, very interesting work in India. You know, these, <laughs> this is the Cyrus crane again, this tallest flying bird in the world, and they, they occur in the equivalent of our prairie potholes throughout this whole region. There's more than 10,000 of these enormous birds on what are diverse traditional agricultural landscapes that are supporting mil literally millions and millions and millions of people in this region. And if those diversified agricultural systems maintain, it keeps the people on the land and it maintains an incredible biodiversity. There's actually more bird biodiversity in this mixed agricultural landscape than in all the protected areas of India, where all the rhinos and tigers are. That's a phenomenal thing. <laughs> our, the guy who heads our India program has been documenting that, did his PhD work on that. But it is a rich landscape when it's diversified agriculture and not monotypic agriculture. And I think that's something to really absorb. Lots and lots of species come under the, the umbrella of, um, of this uh, species. Uh, so think, think, thinking about what types of agricultural systems better help us cope with different climate futures, surely part of that is diversified agricultural systems uh, that can adapt to these changes. In Texas, what's come out so interesting uh, on the work, we're doing a lot of work with, uh, teamed with the Nature Conservancy and others that are buying land on the coast of Texas, is to recognize, yeah, we need about 125,000 acres of good quality, high quality coastal marsh in Texas right now to save the whooping crane. But with, with a meter of sea level rise, it's this coastal land that's gonna be our future marsh. And so a lot of the focus is on trying to protect this, uh, this inland prairie as well as what they need today to try and recover into the future. And that opens up really uh, great opportunities. There's wonderful work done on this by really good thinkers about the future of uh, rich, diversified coasts, trying to take a whole bays and rivers perspective all along. And, and what you realize is not only can you think about the future of the economies of the coast and the future of whooping cranes, but it has a lot of benefit for all the species that currently use those inland areas and uh, you have rare species like the Aplomato falcon that are very dependent on those grasslands that are disappearing very quickly. And it's an opportunity to think about climate change today and tomorrow and think about that tomorrow in a context, maybe it's tomorrow for whooping cranes, maybe it's today for falcons and for other uses. And it gives a, a broader perspective uh, for conservation of species that I think is exciting. Uh, and what can we do here at home? One of the simplest things we can do here at home, and we just lost ground on this in the last month with our new wetlands bill, is maintain the heterogeneity, the, the diversity of wetlands on our landscape, because that's one of our best buffers against climate change, is having a diversity of wetlands across the landscape. Not every, wet, not every good wetland is a deep water cattail marsh. There's lots of other kinds of wetlands out there. Your Ramsar sites up here show that in spades. Um, this little farm uh, pond that was uh, swept away in the legislature uh, can be critical, uh, critical wetland for, for example, for whooping cranes and wintering uh, on migration. So birds and um, our wildlife and people depend on these uh, diversity of wetlands in the landscape. So I, I think it's um, important to think of diversity and diversification of our landscape, whether it's agricultural systems or our wetlands or other things as, as a way to buffer uh, for climate change as well, and create opportunities for biodiversity conservation right now. There's some additional hope in this, at least in the crane world. They've proven to be very adaptable birds. These are whooping cranes out with sandhills and farmland, something we have never seen. This is our reintroduced whooping cranes uh, here in Wisconsin, but something we've never seen with the wild whooping cranes. So maybe they have some ability 
to adapt. Maybe they're more resilient than we think. Uh, this is really astounding, but this is a, a, uh, these are cranes in China in a very dry year in China that started feeding in uplands. We don't know ultimately how long they could sustain those changed diets, but it gives us some hope that maybe they, they can adapt and use other systems. But so a lot of risk and a lot of uncertainty and um, you know, hope only gets you so far. So there's a lot of change there. So just a few summary points. I, climate change is enormously complex and I think we have to accept that. It's difficult to exchange, ex explain, but clearly the risks are very high uh, in many places and for many, many species. And I do think cranes can help us think about that change by looking across just one family of birds and how they intersect with glacial melting, with polar change, with changes in runoff, with extreme weather events, with sea level rise, because all of that affects the crane world and kind of, for me, kind of helps bring it home uh, with a bunch of birds that are big and we kind of can actually see in the wild. And again, a lot of these problems are created because of already the changes that we're making in our land. And one of the best things we can do to buffer against climate change is address the changes that are happening right now to our land and water, independent of all that, how we're saving wetlands on the landscape and grasslands, how we're viewing our farms and our, our futures on the landscape. And then I think there is hope that there are good examples where when we think about climate change mitigation and adaptation and we think about it in land use planning, it, it can lead to positive things now and in the future. I think there's good examples of that, opportunities where we can enhance our biodiversity and our own water and food and energy security by thinking through these systems and the opportunities now. So, a lot of you have already been to visit us, but come by, talk climate change anytime. I love these groups and I, I love the work that you're doing here. Uh, and we're always happy to talk about it more in the context of our birds. And they're just amazing places uh, to go and see them in the wild as well. Uh, I wanna thank people who contributed photos to this from all over the place. And uh, thank you. Oh. Yeah.